40 days of prayer. What a wonderful, wonderful campaign. And as uh, Pastor Nathan said, if you're not part of one of our life groups, we've got 40 life groups operating. In fact, some of them are so big they had to split up in six rooms. Is that right, Chris? Six rooms, one, three rooms. And um, so, so we can have as much discussion as um, uh, possible in watching Dr. Rick Warren's 30 minutes as he shares on prayer. Then we discuss it and work our way through the 40 days workbook. And there's daily devotions over the next 40 days. I trust you've already uh, received and enjoyed. I think we're okay. We'll just leave it there. Just um, So the this uh, booklet, beautiful booklet, you receive if you're part of a life group. So if you haven't joined one, then I encourage you to, to uh, join one today. It's not too late. And so that you get the maximum benefit by attending weekly the service here as we share on the theme and, um, and then also in our small groups. As I think we'll turn this thing off. Turn this one on. Are we okay? Are we there? Can you hear me? So if you only attend Sundays, you'll get about 20% benefit, okay, of uh, the 40 days of prayer. And the sad thing is after three days, you forget 90% of what I shared with you. It's the most depressing statistic for a preacher. Prove me wrong. And if you take down some notes from this, if you bring this with you, then uh, you actually remember more. But I reckon another 25 to 30% in small groups uh, discussing and sharing and applying. And then probably another 30, 40% in uh, your own personal devotion as you day by day read a scripture, answer the questions, memorize a verse a week, and you're applying the word in your life, you will get revived. You will come alive in your faith, okay, from, from perhaps being at this level and you'll kick up to another level. Your, your prayer life will be transformed. There will be answers that will start coming through uh, and uh, your faith level will rise to believe God for the impossible to take place in your life. So I encourage you, don't miss this opportunity. Do you get telephone calls with people who think they know you? Hi, Bill. Good morning to you. Great to talk to you. And they don't identify themselves. They start their conversation and you say, and who are you? And uh, where are you from? And you end up finding out it's some company and some group trying to sell you something. And then you say, how'd you get my telephone number? They won't answer that. And, uh, but isn't it interesting that when that happens, you just can't talk to them openly. You can't talk to them personally. It becomes, for me, a very formal, non-emotional conversation. In fact, I have to pull back because they get you in. So you, you've got to kind of rise up and put up a, a barrier, don't you? So, and, and sometimes you end up, fit, they make you feel guilty if you don't want to continue talking. Now I'm hardened to this. I say, you know what? I'm too busy today. And please don't ring me back. See you later. Have a good day. Boom. And I'm guiltless. I don't feel any guilt or shame or fear. Anyone broken through like that? For, right? it, it can be hard. But straight away you notice yourself becoming very formal and very matter of fact. And uh, because you don't know them. They don't know you. And what you know about, about a person determines really how you talk to them. And so the more distant they are, the more formal it becomes. The, the, the more, if they're closer to you, the more personal and engaging and emotional the conversation. Our understanding of what God is really like, what he's really like, shapes us. It'll shape you. And it shapes everything else in our lives, including how we pray. And nothing influences your view of life more than how you actually view God. And that's why I want to focus on 
God's goodness this morning. So what is God really like? There are many characteristics. You know, he's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent, big words. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. He can be here and he can be all over the world throughout the universe at the same time and be just as connected here and with you and with everyone else. He's unchanging in his essential nature and character. He's just, perfectly just, but at the same time, perfectly loving. That's almost impossible for us to be perfectly just and perfectly loving. He's so kind and holy, but goodness is probably the best word to describe the essence of his nature. Look at Psalm 100 verse 5 in the Living Bible. For the Lord is always good. He is always loving and kind. Notice, always. And his faithfulness goes on and on to each succeeding generation. As Laura was singing that song, I thought, God, you've been so faithful to me. And at times I've been so faithless. Like I think, oh, you know, like you haven't rejected me. At times I've quivered in fear and unbelief and self-doubt. And, but he has been faithful to me and uh, over these nearly 50 years that I've known him. Because God is always good, Jesus' plans for your life will always be good. That's the very first thing I want to say. Because God is always good, always good, Jesus' plans for my life, for your life, will always be good, always be good. If you don't hear anything else today, if you can get this on the inside, it'll transform your prayer life, your understanding. See, God cannot do evil because he's the source of goodness. Evil occurs in our world because people ignore God's love laws. And we will make bad decisions when we're not aligned to our good God. Is there anything God cannot do? Yes. He cannot do evil. He cannot plan evil because he is good. He cannot lie because he is the truth. He cannot be selfish because he is selflessly loving. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you. Personalize it. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Folks, we are not accidents. You are not an accident. There are plenty of accidental parents, we know, but there are no accidental children. You might say, but my parents didn't plan me. It was a glorious accident. Well, it wasn't an accident. Or they were planning to have a boy and they got a girl. <laughs> I'm just an accident. I'm not that... Imp- hey, there are no accidental children. God has children. God's plans for me are revealed and realized through, through prayer. You will never fully understand his plans. They're revealed to you. They're realized as you develop intimacy with him and get to know him and, and, and let him get... Let him into your life in a powerful way. He wants to bless your life in front of others. His abundant blessings are a powerful witness. Look at Psalm 31. How great is the goodness you've stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. So in front of other people, he wants to bless you because it's a powerful witness. When they say, wow, what's happening to you? Your relationship with God will shine. His blessings in your life will speak to them. How great is the goodness you've stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. However, everything in my life is not good. (laughs) Seems like a paradox. We live in a cursed world. We live on a broken planet. Because of sin, our first parents sin. And that's transmitted to all of us. And all of us have a disposition to make bad choices, wrong choices. I know for myself, in my teenage years, I look back and I think, man, from 11 years of age, even before I was a teenager, till nearly 18, 
and I got saved in, in my 17th year. And, uh, and man, I, I was abusing alcohol like you've got to believe. Abusing alcohol, getting drunk as a 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old, taking marijuana and, uh, and getting high. And the, I made some really bad choices, <laughs> really bad choices in, in those inebriated high states. And there were terrible consequences. And uh, after I got saved, I reckon it took about three or four years before I could actually break free at, from the, the habit patterns and the, the kind of shadows that were created in my life because of those addictions. But God is greater than my choices. He saved me in spite of our, the terrible consequences of, of our sin. He saves us. He forgives us. And he gradually transforms us to become the people that we are meant to be. He has great plans for us. Have a look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Wow. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. The devil doesn't win. Sin doesn't win. God has won through the life of his son coming to show us what he's like, dying on a cross for us, rising again, bringing the gift of forgiveness, restoring us back to the Father, shameless, fearless, guiltless, all those removed, and then sending us the gift of the Spirit to live within us. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And folks, this even includes the most painful incidents that we want to forget. Even the hurts from the sin of others, God covers. You think of Joseph in the, in the story of the Bible, in the final chapters of Genesis. What an amazing story. And uh, his 11 brothers, what they did to him. Terrible. They actually planned to kill him because of jealousy. They threw him in a pit that he couldn't be able to get out. So he just imagined the death that would have occurred if he did no water, no food, in a pit. I mean, that would be terrible for him to die that way. And one of the brothers said, oh, you know, maybe, maybe we should just sell him into slavery and, and we won't kill him, but, you know, sell him into slavery. And a and, uh, terrible thing that these brothers did. Now, Joseph was a little pain. He was a braggart, prideful, <laughs> and kept very egotistical as a young kid. And somehow, and he was his daddy's favourite, and somehow that evoked envy and jealousy and, uh, within the lives of the brothers, and they, they planned this dastardly deed. And, and he ends up in, in Egypt, ends up in, in prison, accused falsely. He goes, they, they sell him to be a slave of Mr Potiphar, and he's a good-looking boy, He's only a teenager, late teens, and Mrs. Potiphar has an eye for him, so she's an adulteress and she wants to develop a relationship with him. And good old Joseph, he just runs away from her every time. And there's a good, good answer for temptation. When it comes your way, run away. If he sat there and said, started reasoning and saying, oh, Mrs. Potiphar, let's discuss this. You like me? You think I'm attractive? You want to have sex with me? Let's sit down and reason this thing through. No, 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 no. You can't reason that one through. God gave him two good strong legs and that was the means by which he could overcome temptation. Turn around and run the other way. Don't run towards it. So uh, it's the best way to overcome temptation. Uh, some people, when, they, when I counsel them, they're, they're struggling with temptation and the temptation comes and, and they're trying to battle it in their mind. Oh, I've got to resist it, I've got to resist it. And actually, the more they resist it, the more they're thinking about it. And I say, look, maybe the best thing you should do is just grab your snooker cue and go and have a game of snooker. Or grab the tennis racket and or ring up a friend, Tony, say, hey, Tony, can we go and have a cup of coffee? What are you doing? You're changing the scene of battle. You're not fighting it with your mind. You're actually changing the scene of battle. And you, you're going to, you don't even have to tell the person you're going through a tough time. Just change it. Go and be with them. And what happens is 
is your mind will calm down. The viciousness of the temptation will go away. Your desire will subside and you're building a new habit. You're actually walking away. You're running away. You're doing the opposite and not trying to fight it in your own way. Well, anyway, Joseph, he did it the right way. And he ends up in prison and then through a series of circumstances, amazingly, he ends up becoming the prime minister of Egypt. What? In a pit by hateful brothers. They sell him into slavery. And Mr. Potiphar liked him because he was really competent. He was a good young man, good, good character, good competent. And he put him in charge of his household. And Mrs. Potiphar wrecked it. <laughs> and he ends up in prison. And when he's in prison, God gets him out miraculously through some dreams that he interpreted. And he ends up becoming the jolly prime minister of Egypt. I mean, that seems r- ridiculous. At a time when the world was going through famine. And again, Pharaoh, he has some dreams. And, and, and this young man, he interprets them. And his interpretation was, man, there's going to be some lean years. And there's, there's some abundant years and lean years. So when, in the abundant years, let's save all the grain as much as we can. So he ended up piling up the grain in Egypt and it saved the world as people came and, and, and got grain to, to survive. And uh, so his brothers come. You know, 20, 30 years later, his brothers come to get help because they're starving. And so their dad sends them, their dear old dad. And uh, you've got to read the story. I mean, it's a fantastic story, particularly when, when the brothers come in and don't recognize him. <laughs> and he sees them and he can't believe it. And he runs outside and he starts weeping and he comes back and he plays a bit of a ruse with them. And, uh, um, but this is what he says at the end. Because the brothers think, we're dead meat. He's going to kill us. We're going to be strung up like... And this is what he said. You intended to harm me. The end of Genesis chapter 50. But God attended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Wow, how's that? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for all good. So what happened to him was not good. God wasn't the cause of that. It was their bad choices as a result of his self-centered braggadocio and he becomes a humble guy he had learned he had grown in character and somehow God worked good to come out of this he brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people folks this is what we call redemptive suffering and it's awesome when you see and experience it in your life It's awesome when you see and experience it, but it's not pleasant to go through. There was a period of time many years ago where I was filled with hatred, absolute hatred for my wife's father. Uh, His crimes were just terrible, terrible crimes. But he committed against Kath in violence as a little girl, just terrible beatings that he should have been put in prison really and then when we found out he had sexually abused a daughter from his first marriage and then Kath's younger sister and and that story has been told here um, it was just it was just a terrible situation and because my marriage was faltering because of the consequences of of what was taking place and my reactions towards how different Kath and I were. I loved her dearly. She loved me, but it was just... And I remember, I hated him. I never told anyone. You know, like, I wanted him in jail. We couldn't put him in jail because there was a statute of limitations. And uh, so un- until the Family First Party changed that, and so people that committed offences before 1982 could be put in jail if they committed offences against children. And so... Uh, so, but in my heart, I hated him, and I, it was wrecking. It was affecting me to the point that if I let that hatred in and take control, I think I would have. I couldn't have survived as a pastor. I reckon it would have wrecked my marriage, wrecked my my whole life because I'm consumed by vengeance. I'm consumed by by this guy should be in jail. I never wanted to see him. And my little kids are crying out to me, "Oh, Dad, you know, you don't love." Grandpa, you just love your parents. We are always going around to see them. Every day I'd visit my parents. Good Greek boy. 
particularly after mum had a stroke, and, and would visit Kath's parents maybe once every so and I'd have to be there. I'd have to be there. So my little kids would be walking around and going in the shed where he was, and I'd be following, just watching. Because we couldn't say anything to them until they got older. So I'm, I'm, I'm raging on this. And you know, God broke into my life by helping me understand his goodness. It would have wrecked me. And, and what happened was, I got a revelation of my wife and my kids. I thought, I'm such a fortunate person to have a wife like this and four beautiful children. And then it hit me that if it wasn't for that miserable old man, I wouldn't have my wife and my four kids. Like, I saw it. I saw, you know what? He's made in the image of God. He chose to behave like a devil. It was his free choice to do the sins and the crimes he committed. But I, I, I thought, if it wasn't for him, my kids, my wife, my grandkids are a product of him. The good part of him, made in the image of God. A good God used him to produce magnificent children and grandchildren in spite of his sin. And it just hit me. And then I started thanking God for him. <laughs> How's that? I started thanking God for him. Not for his sins, not for his crimes. I never trusted him. I couldn't trust him. I wouldn't let my kids go there on their own. No way. Yes, he should have been put in jail. That's beside the point. He needed to be justice, but that wasn't possible. But for me, I had to start thanking God for him, that God used him somehow to produce these magnificent children that I would take a bullet for. Every parent would. And it was the goodness of God greatness of God, the goodness of God, the sovereignty of God, how God causes good to come out of terrible situations that changed me, and I think it would have sunk me. Like if, you, if you've got a root of bitterness in your heart towards somebody who's committed a crime against you, you don't deal with it, it'll eat its way in and destroy your life. And so dealing with it doesn't mean you agree with what's happened to you. God forbid, evil is evil, sin is sin. Injustice is terrible. But we're talking about your relationship with a good God. When you see this, it transforms you. So I, my prayer life, I could actually visualize him and thank God for him. I saw the angelic side of his nature, not the demonic side. I saw the good that God did, not discounting the evil and saying, oh, well, now let's become best buddies and, and you know, keep abusing. No, no, no way. So this is redemptive suffering. This is the story of Joseph. When you see it, it transforms your prayer life. Prayer doesn't become a drudgery. It's not a duty. It's like, wow, such a good God. I want to get close to him. I, I, just, I can believe for anything. He's a miracle-working God. He loves to answer prayer because he's totally good. If you don't see it, you, your prayer life will go, oh, yeah. This transforms your relationship with him when, when you see it. We all love eating delicious cakes, don't we? Oh, particularly Greek cakes. Oh, the custard. Have you ever seen them made? A cake made? You love the cake? Well, what about all the ingredients that make it? Just when they're all lined up, they just go and eat them. Eat the flour. You, you spit it out. There's bitter in there at times, as well as the sweet. The salt. Oh. But all the ingredients, in, when you see it, you think, what good can come out of this? But then when the end result comes out, this beautiful cake, you eat it. A bit like the sovereignty of God, the goodness of God. If you see the bits and pieces of your life and you focus on the loss, you focus on the evil, you focus on your sins instead of the forgiveness that comes your way. If you're still thinking about the sins you've committed long ago, it means you haven't fully grasped the loving forgiveness of God for you. So if you come to him and say, you know, God, I sinned back then, he goes, I don't remember. Uh, well, what are you talking about? It's not even in my thinking. Why are you thinking that way? Or the sins that have been committed against you. Got to focus on the goodness. 
the sovereignty, his good working. That's why that scripture in Romans 8 is, is fantastic. So folks, Jesus is far more interested in developing your character to become like his than in just keeping you in a comfortable state. Romans 5.3 says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. We can, <laughs> but we know that they help us develop patience or endurance. Joseph grew into a magnificent man from the precocious, braggart and prideful young man that he was. Because God is always good, Jesus' plans for your life will always be good. Secondly, Jesus always will give me and give you what you need, not what you deserve. Wow. If we all got what we deserve, none of us would be here. Psalm 103 says, in his goodness, he does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Your confessed sin will never boomerang back to you. Never. King David, I mean, if Joseph is an example of God's sovereignty and goodness, what about King David? He did some terrible things. Joseph didn't do terrible things, but King David did some terrible things. terrible act of adultery that was so destructive and then he murders an innocent man did he deserve mercy no David didn't deserve mercy but he knew God was good so look at what he prayed in Psalm 51 be gracious to me oh God according to your loving kindness According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. See, God doesn't forgive you because you're good. He forgives you because he is good. God does even more than forgive us when we sin. He welcomes us back. He doesn't reject us. He receives us even when we have really blown it. And one of our greatest fears and I'm sure it's your, one of your greatest fears, is the fear of rejection. We do everything possible to avoid rejection. We even order our lives to prevent the fear of rejection. This is why we work so hard to cover up all the bad parts of our lives. And as I mentioned last week, we wear masks. But because God is good, he will never, ever, 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 ever reject you. Look at Psalm 27. Even if my father and mother abandoned me, the Lord will hold me close. Lead me along the right path. My enemies are waiting for me. Yet I am confident I will see, what? The Lord's goodness while I'm here in the land of the living. I've got all my kids and grandkids to memorize that verse. I cannot help but believe I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living because God is good. When you deep down know that God is good and gracious, it makes you bolder and more confident in your prayers. If you doubt his goodness... You're going to approach him with a sense of inferiority, a sense of, well, I don't know if he's going to hear me or I'm uncertain whether I'm going to receive the answer. When you deep down know that God is good and he's gracious, it'll make you really bold in prayer. And to have an expectant faith, a confidence. Look at Hebrews 4. This high priest, Jesus of ours understands our weaknesses Jesus understands you he knows you you can't hide anything from him for he faced all the same testings we do yet he never sinned we sin he never sins <laughs> so let us come boldly if you know how he understands you because of his goodness you can come boldly to the throne of grace there you will receive his mercy and you'll find grace to help you when most in need Finally, let me say this. Because God is always good, Jesus put my good above his own good. This is the heart of the gospel. It's the ultimate expression of love. The shepherd dies for the sheep. The king sacrifices his life for the people. It's not like the people join the army to save the king's life. The king sacrifices his life for his people. This is the essence of our faith. 
God says, I love you so much that it hurts me. Look at John 4, 10, 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me and I lay down my life. I sacrifice it for the sheep. John 15. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Wow. See, Jesus didn't just die for you. He imparted his goodness into you. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. I love that in the Living Bible. This is the only way we can get to heaven. He didn't just do away with our badness. He gave us his goodness to live within us through the Holy Spirit. Romans 4.25. He died for our sins and rose again to make us right with God, filling us with God's goodness. This is amazing. You might say, but Bill, what does it have to do with prayer? Can we kind of land this? It has everything to do with prayer. Romans 8.32, memorize this verse above all the verses I've given to you. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? He solves our biggest problem by dying on the cross. Therefore, folks, everything else you need is small in comparison. If he did this to save you, why won't he answer your prayers? Of course he will answer your prayers. So why wouldn't he help you in every aspect of your life here on, on this earth? God wants to show his goodness to you by answering your prayers. And again, as I mentioned last week, it may, it may be a no. It may be a not yet. So what do you want to see God do in your life over these next few weeks as we've started this 40 days of prayer campaign? What do you really want him to do? Can you write out your prayer? Not something that's easy, but something that's hard, that requires God to work miraculously. Because he says, according to your faith, so be it to you. He wants to answer your prayers and he wants you to understand that he, your prayer life, you can be bold in your asking because it's rooted in his goodness and understanding that he is good and kind and so wants to, to work in your life. Don't waste this opportunity. Look, the devil is afraid of your prayers. The devil's afraid of your prayers. As you seriously embrace the spiritual disciplines of this campaign, and many of you made a commitment. Last week and the week before, I gave out this 40 days of prayer card. You signed it. It's in your Bible. If you haven't, you can grab one. Read it through. Make a commitment to him. Sign it. Keep it in your Bible. Date it. He is a, the devil is afraid of, of, of your prayers when you embrace the spiritual disciplines of this campaign. And this is why you may be experiencing some unusual pushback from the enemy of your souls. And I've heard some stories already. People are going, man, I cannot believe that the more you draw closer to God, the more you're serious, that you're praying daily, you're reading that scripture, you're doing the 40 days, you're going to that life group, you're believing for your friends, as if he's going to, I mean, He's not going to worry about you if you're not a prayer. If you doubt God's goodness and, and then you think, oh, well, you just, if you're a slacker, and you know, I'll pray once a week when I have a need. You know, God's a celestial Santa Claus. He's a great big divine vending machine. I just press the button and when I have a need, I'll talk to him. Hey, that's childish. He wants us to grow up, to be mature, to know him. You start getting serious and the devil will oppose you. There'll be unusual trouble in your house sometimes. <laughs> Normal things that a husband and wife can do, all of a sudden become inflamed. Or sudden sickness, or some diversion to stop you from praying. He will do anything to stop you praying. Divert your attention from building your altar day by day, that place where you want to seek him and do the 40 days. Build this habit into your life. Wow. 
Anytime God wants to do something new and great in your life, in your family, in our church, in your career, in our nation, he begins it by moving us on the inside to pray. And it's because we understand how good he is and gracious he is. Look at Psalm 119 before I lead you in prayer. In fact, let's stand together. Let's stand and I want, we'll read this together. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. You're receiving life through his word. The Sunday messages, the, the Rick Warren material in, in your life group. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. I long to obey your commandments. Renew my life with what? Your goodness. And Jeremiah writes, bring us back to you, God. We're ready to come back. Give us a fresh start. Let's close our eyes and pray together. Lord, revive our hearts through this 40 days campaign. As we're standing here today, we open ourselves to you and we say, Lord, revive our hearts. Revive my heart. Touch every person here. Lord, revive our life groups that we're not just going through the motions of just fellowshipping together, which is beautiful, but that we're growing spiritually together, connected to you as well as being connected to each other, understanding the power of prayer, how your presence and power is released through prayers of faith as we connect with you. Revive our life group and Lord, our entire church family, the Christian Family Centre, this congregation, our 10.30 congregation, our 5.30 congregation, our Friday morning, 11 o'clock congregation, the hundreds of people, men, women and children, our kids' church, our youth, revive us, O oh Lord. Move miraculously in and through our lives. Help us to believe for that thing that is Lord, out of reach, not out of sight because we can see it with the eyes of faith, but out of our reach and requires our faith and our prayer, our determination, our persistence, the application of your word in our lives. Help us to believe. For that person who doesn't know you, who's dear to our hearts, we pray for them. Give us the courage to invite them to our life group, to to come to this service or one of the other services. Revive your church, Lord, to be all that it's meant to be. And while we're standing in, in God's presence before we conclude, no one looking around. It's just a moment of, of personal commitment. If you haven't received Jesus as your Savior and you know that he is speaking to your heart, and you're saying, Bill, I, I need Christ in my life. I'm here because I believe he's good, but he's outside of the orbit of your life and you want him on the inside of your life. You need him to experience his healing and forgiveness and goodness. I'd love to catch up with you after the service or Pastor Nathan, but let's start to pray with you where you're standing. Just lift your hand up where you are and I'll see it. And you, can, you need Jesus as your saviour. You've never done it before. Just lift your hand. I'll pray for you. Then we'll conclude the service. You know he's calling you. Yeah, God bless you. It's good. Wonderful. Anyone else? Just lift your hand up where you are. You need Jesus in your life. He loves you. He's got great plans for you. He wants to reveal his goodness to you. He wants to answer your prayers. He wants to work some miracles in you. Anyone else to join this person who said yes to Jesus? You're saying, I need him. I want him as my saviour. Just lift your hand up for a moment. Father, thank you for this precious soul that's said yes to Jesus. And I pray that you would meet with her, save her, heal her, 
transform her, her life and her family. For all of us, Lord, as we're standing in your presence, we say thank you, thank you, thank you that you are good. Thank you now that we can be emboldened in our praying and our believing over these next weeks and for the rest of our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.